has worked uh, to develop NIBA-based approaches to support environmental decision-making for offshore oil and gas decommissioning in Australia, Arab Arabian Gulf, California, Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico, Gulf of Thailand, North Sea, and Ireland. Uh, Mr. Nicolette co-authored the first formalized NIBA framework, focusing on site remediation and restoration recognized by the United States Environmental Protection Agency, uh, the agency's Science Advisory Board, the National Oceanic and uh, Atmospheric Administration, and the Australian Maritime Safety Authority. Joe is recognized for his natural, natural resource damage assessment, experience and role in pioneering ecosystem service economic-based evaluation methods for evaluating economical injury and restoration. Uh, Joe was uh, certified as a, uh, as a fisheries scientist by the American Fisheries Society in 1992. Uh, Joe, welcome. Uh, uh, we will be glad to see your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about today is, you know, when we think about decommissioning and one of the, obviously, the dis decisions are, um, do we remove the entire uh, structure? Do we partially remove it? Do we create a reef, move it to a reef location um, or manage it in situ? There's, there's a variety of obvious options that, that we can look at. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, net environmental benefit analysis based comparative assessment approach that uh, I, I've been working for uh, uh, in, in a, quite a bit in, in, in that field for, for a while. Um, the uh, and, and I'm going to talk about a little bit how we got here, because a comparative assessment is typically the, the process in which you'd identify what are the options you're going to implement for the for your decommissioning program. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about why it was developed and then uh, uh, have a little bit of discussion about that as I go, go through that. Um, as, as mentioned, I've, I've spent uh, you know, over 30 years, uh, really a lot of focus on net environmental benefit analysis, uh, which is really a risk benefit comparison of between alternatives. How, how do you manage these competing alternatives? Um, the uh, and I've worked on that since you know early on the Exxon Valdez uh, spill up through Deepwater Horizon and a variety of uh, uh, sites uh, as well across the world. Um, the uh, one one of the things uh, the first uh, formalized framework for uh, net environmental benefit analysis I, I co-authored here with uh, uh, risk assessors from Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the Environmental Protection Agency. And this really served as a basis for uh, net environmental benefit analysis and how it was developed and, and, and moved through uh, uh, through its progress. One of the key things that net environmental benefit analysis does it incorporates ecosystem services into that comparison process and raises questions about how do we quantify some of those values. When we think about ecosystem services, they provide an ecological habitat value. And because you have that habitat value, it also provides a variety of human use values or human use services. And those services could be direct or consumptive uses, like you can actually fish, boat, dive, and actively use the resource. Uh, but there are also values in terms of uh, indirect uses, like passive or non-consumptive uses. Those are uses in the fact that we have a value for a habitat because it protects or supports a threatened endangered species. So there are basically existence values or bequest values associated with resources. But in, at the end of the day, keep in mind that all those human use services, you cannot have those if we don't have the ecological habitat services. So actions that affect the habitat can affect the value and the change in those human use service values. Uh, and, and I know um, previously Sean talked uh, quite a bit about the the, the, the value of, struct of, uh, of these structures, um, as, as did Dr. Roberts. The uh, we've learned a lot over, and really I think what comes out is we've learned a lot since a lot of the regulations, you know, and some of the regulations have been put in place, especially with OSPAR, for example. You know, over 30 years ago, 
um, we've really learned quite a bit about what are the benefits of subsea structure. Um, you know, this hard structure that's been in place uh, pri provides a, a colonizing uh, habitat and for, you know, benthos, which then, you know, attracts fish, which then, then you know, attracts marine mammals and so on and so forth. Um, and then, you know, because shells in a lot of places and each site's different, but when you have uh, a, a lot of these uh, platforms will create a shell hash area uh, towards the bottom of the platform that actually after over time builds into a, uh, uh, a hard substrate structure itself. And then there's because of all the biological activity around the platform, you uh, um, you have a, a what's called a halo or shadow area of additional biological value. That's really when you think of that all as one ecosystem. It's it tends to be much greater than what you see you know when you get outside of that zone. Um, and so you know we we know that fish uh, it's been determined fish not it's not just aggregating fish but fish produce there which is really good for helping to help protect fish stocks as an example. Uh, Dr. Victoria Todd worked quite a bit with marine mammals in looking at, you know, how do they use the platforms in terms of seals or looking at dolphins and so forth, porpoises. So there's um, a, a lot of different uh, information that we've really found and in, in, in a lot of these that we've looked at in uh, the various locations all pretty much supports some type of threatened endangered species or or other or other types of uh, species of special significance and as well as uh, you know uh, uh, dr. Roberts mentioned as well the connectivity is a, a really big deal as well um, and then there there's also the um, the, the uh, diving photography and education types of, of areas and it's, it's been met, mentioned before too that you know these really act as de facto marine protected areas because they've had an exclusion zone and it hasn't allowed trawl fishing and other types of uh, intrusive activities um, in, in, into that zone. It's just really for the oil and gas operators to basically manage the, uh, the, the operations you know, at that location. So the, uh, one of the things when you think about ecosystem services an important concept is a habitat provides services and it provides those services over time. And this is you know, just a, for conceptual to understand it. And that baseline level of value may change over time, but in any event, you know, there's value provided over time. Um, and it, in one of the things that uh, we look at is, well, how long are these gonna last in the, uh, in the environment? And it looks like these can last for uh, quite a, quite a while looking at degradation rates in the North Sea. I know some of the projections are between 600 and 1,000 years, you know, uh, depending on, on conditions as well, and uh, also uh, some projections. And, and that's really those, those projections are uh, without uh, cathodic protection, which is occurring on quite a few, uh, well, on, on these uh, subsea structures. So, what happens then is if you look at this and you think about what happens, you have this baseline level of value that this has created, which we've all talked about. Um, if there's a point in time where you implement a full removal, well, you lose that ecosystem that you had there today, and you lo lose that ecosystem in into the future, you know, from that site. Um, and basically there's, and what that means is because of that time frame, it's not just value to us today, but there's values that are multi-generational and intergenerational, such as, you know, existence and bequest values, or the fact that you've lost this, uh, you know, or, or declines in fish stock over, over what you've removed and so on and so forth. Um, so there can be significant impacts. So potential for significant impacts to the, to the ecology. So, when you think of a net environmental benefit analysis, we're really looking at risks and, and implementing options to manage potential risks. And this is just a generic um, uh, cost benefit curve that you see and that you see risks. And a lot of times as we address risk with our actions, we, we implement options, get more intrusive on the environment. And there's really a, a, a cost benefit analysis to this where when you look at uh, the change in risk and the cost, you get to a point where you know you're, you're getting marginal changes in risk. They're really spending a lot more money to to be able to manage those risks. One of the things that's 
a lot of times lost in this whole concept is the big focus and, and, and the big focus on what we see in decommissioning is what on are the potential risks. And what happens though, when we talk about implementing things that become more intrusive and on, on the environment, there can be a situation where, and, and when, when you look at this point where there's a break point where when I go from option one to two, not only am I spending a lot more money, getting a marginal change in risk, but I'm also creating a, a, a significant environmental impact, which is the green bar, which then translates to, you know, uh, any of those uh, human uses that were or in human use values that were associated with it can also be impacted. So it's really trying to consider this overall risk benefit analysis and how do we go about to, to look at this information and, and, and balance it. So the um, uh, one of the things that in, in about you know, 15 years ago, looking at this and, and looking at the original paper that we published in 2004, you know, we think about what we've heard today so far is that you know these sites you know this framework really works and it's when you need to balance the risks and benefits of an action if the site is ambiguous and that ambiguity ambigu ambiguity arises when the site retains ecological value which it does in this case when the actions are themselves environmentally damaging and that can definitely be the case as well and when the ecological risks from the in situ condition are relatively small uncertain or limited to a component of the ecosystem, especially uh, in comparison to the potential impacts of, uh, of the second point there. So the question becomes, what is that trade-off? And so in the context of decommissioning, uh, it, the thought is that this NEBA framework can actually address that ambiguity that arises in, in this decision-making process. So, and the other thing too, when you think about consistency with the precautionary principle, that principle implies that if an action or policy has a suspected risk of causing harm to the public or to the environment in the absence of scientific consensus that the action or policy is not harmful, the burden of proof that is not harmful falls on those taking the action. So when, when, I, when I think about that, that principle, it, it sort of rings bell to me. If, if somebody is making a, a decision or action or policy to completely remove this, Based on the information we know now, it identifies that there is a potential risk of causing harm to the public and those ecosystem services in, in the environment. So, really flipping that that concept around, um, it seems to it, it looks like that that principle applies and why this approach would be available to uh, be able to use to actually compare that or one of the tools that can be used. So how do we, you know, use this to demonstrate the risks and uh, and so forth, and the benefits? Um, you know, I've been involved in, in this approach. I've used environmental benefit analysis concepts in over twenty countries, uh, uh, but from offshore decommissioning, multiple, I think, over thirty different platforms and a variety of different locations uh, you know, the, that you can see here. So uh, really looking at this approach and how it can be used to help in the, the environmental decision-making process. Um, in the comparative assessment process, in a lot of the, my discussions, not only with operators, but also with a lot of the regulatory agencies, with, was there some uncertainty in the decision-making that we're seeing by regulators um, in that the guidance on uh, comparative assessments is, is, is very vague. So, so they can be done in a, a wide variety of ways. Um, and sometimes you get a lot of weighting and ranking, which and sometimes may affect the rigor and what you see, see in the results. Is it really scientifically based? Um, and, you know, is it replicable? Uh, can you reduce the transparency? Because it's important that uh, to have transparency. And uh, with a, a lot of the weighting and ranking that can introduce stakeholder, has the potential to introduce stakeholder bias at that point. And as I mentioned earlier, is a focus on risks and ecological and social benefits have been understated or overlooked in that decision-making process. So, um, and then, you know, how do you present the results? The agencies were getting, uh, in one jurisdiction, would get a wide variety of different types of comparative assessments. And so for them to be able to analyze and go back for and replicate what, what was conducted, they were having a little trouble with that, which, uh, it seemed like it was one of the key issues that, that, that they had. Um, so the uh, the characteristics of approach is really what this approach was looked at was 
you know, to align it with the regulatory frameworks, address the five major factors of health and safety. And it's not just when we say NEVA and that environmental benefit analysis, we're also looking at health and safety, social, economic, and technical factors in this, as well as environmental. Um, and the goal here is to be objective, look at the science, uh, develop it uh, scientifically defendable. Um, is it, you know, uh, can you replicate it? And in, in, in really to help develop some consistency on how uh, th this process moves forward. And, and obviously, you know, including relevant uh, stakeholder input. Um, in 2023, just in January of this year, we published uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, this framework, a NEBA-based comparative assessment. And this is, it's really an adaptation of the 2004 paper, but really focused on offshore decommissioning. And it really goes through an, an analysis planning process, uh, goes through an options analysis, goes through a risk management uh, approach. And in that risk management, it's not just looking at what the science says, but also uh, when you when you look at that, um, being being able to go through and look at the thresholds in the different va values that you're looking at. So we we want to bring a, a quant quantitation in, into the approach uh, to help support the, the scientific rigor in, in this in this process. And again, I mentioned stakeholder engagement. This. Uh, plan or this uh, this approach, the NEBA-based comparative assessment, as I mentioned, it includes those five key areas of the economic or financial, technical, social, environmental, and health and safety aspects. But one of the important things this does, and rather than just looking values that you collect at a point in time, it's really important to understand those multi-generational values. Because if I have this uh, platform, for example, providing a certain value today or a field that's providing a the group of platforms providing a certain value today, if that all gets removed, what does that look like in, in, into the future? What is the effect on the multi-generational values on ecological values and on uh, uh, potential uh, human use values and so forth? And again, like I say, this approach does not rely on ranking or weighting schemes. Um, it, it when you you know, show show a little bit about what what the, the data looks like, but really, what's going to happen uh, when you look at this at the end of the day is that you could bring in ranking or weighting towards the end if you wanted to. But the point here is, let's show what the science is is, is demonstrating, and then based on that, at least you have a basis from which, if, if there is going to be any ranking or weighting, that it could be supported in in a, in a particular manner to to make it uh, uh, move forward and transparent. And again, the transparency is very important in this regard. Uh, in this process, we uh, look at a lot of different types of metrics that we can quantify. You know, this is just a list and, and the paper lists all these uh, th these different variables um, or metrics. But really, you know, the metrics, we're trying to collect metrics in that variety of areas and looking at, you know, for example, you know, the hard structure is very important. Um, and that hard structure can be surface area, surface areas, volumes, you can develop a complexity for different sections of a platform as you're looking at fisheries data. There's a wide variety of looking at, at the data, but you're really quantifying this, these data for each option that you look at. And so we'll look at hard structure. You could look at fisheries biomass, uh, benthic biomass, benthic coverage. Uh, are there other net ecosystem service values you want to incorporate? And there are also some potential negative ones, because when you implement an option, it might create greenhouse gas emissions because you're using more energy and fuel usage to implement and so on and so forth. Uh, we look at the economic and social values, you know, like commercial fishing, uh, fish processing sector, uh, recreational values. You can look at all, all types of other active uh, values, whether it's diving, passive use values, you can look at potential existence and bequest values. And excuse me, and um, but you know the other thing you're trying to do is balance each different option with what is the effect on risk? Are there navigation risks? Um, uh, if you're going to reef it in place, is there potential navigation risk, or how can you manage that? Could you cut it and create a reef right next to the uh, next to the jacket with uh, an upper portion that you, you cut? Um, is there buoyancy risk if, uh, risk if if you're working with an FPSO, for example, floating production storage offloading unit? Um, 
uh, is there potential for trough snagging risks or potential loss of life? Uh, and that's important. And this is where man, you know, when you look at the uh, exclusion zone, keeping the exclusion zone can actually help to manage some of these. If you keep, for example, keep an area reef, to keep an exclusion zone, you can actually help protect that as almost like a, a marine protected area, uh, but help minimize risk to navigation risk, trawling, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and are there any residual risks from chemicals or potential from pl plastics, uh, ecological degradation? And then we'll look, also look at health and safety risk. When you implement in your campaign to implement all the options that you look at, um, you will look at these potential loss of life risks, injury risks, and so forth. And then look at uh, uh, the other one that's important is the implementation costs. And implementation costs are important, but within this process, we, we really focus on the, um, with the goal of maximizing the environmental benefits while managing site risks. So implementation costs really in this respect uh, comes in as a second, even though it's very important, it still comes in as a secondary uh, a metric because it's, uh, uh, it's really maximizing that value for the public while minimizing risk with, with that different alternative. And uh, the uh, the way the data looks in this, and this here is an example that shows uh, from keeping a site in place, a place, let's say this is a platform, um, to full removal with potential to do interim cuts and remove the top portions of a of a platform. This is from a case study in the North Sea. Um, and again, you know, you have detrimental. Uh, your risks are on the bottom and pointing downward. Your benefits are pointing upward. Um, in, gen in general, in, in this case, and there's multiple scenarios we looked at, but in this case, you could see, as you would expect, as you remove the hard structure, you know, and look at, you know, projected changes in fisheries and these other types of uh, uh, parameters that are beneficial, you'd, you'd get a decline in the, the, those benefits. And at the same time, you see, well, what happens to the risks? And because obviously you're spending a lot more effort, uh, some of those uh, actions can reduce risk and other actions can actually uh, create more risk. And the way these are graphed is it's important. Like if you look at cost here on the right, um, every cost bar is plotted proportional to that cost variable. Because you can see all the metrics down here, they're incorporated in a variety of different types of metrics on different scales. You needed to pull this type of chart together to be able to graph them all on, on a site. So. This allows you to visually compare what, what that looks like. Um, and uh, the, uh, so is there an optimized option that, that, that might work, that might work in that case? Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, in, in looking through this process, we're developing something that is objective, uh, you know, transparent, it's flexible, quantitative and scientifically defendable. And the, um, the last thing um, we put on this is it's typically been a desktop study. In some cases, we may need more ROV data, but for the most part, all the data to implement this process is pretty much available uh, from the operator to be able to do these valuations, or it's out in the public where we're able to gather the information to generate those those different uh, aspects. So that really opens the uh, risk benefit discussion on you know for decision making on on what we we go ahead and do and with that i uh that's uh the end of that so um i again i appreciate uh the the opportunity to walk through that i know it was uh a lot in a little bit of time so